Welcome to Before It's Gone, the podcast where we talk about things that are threatened by climate change. I'm Gretchen. Today, I'm talking to Chris Miller from Ben & Jerry's about what warmer weather will mean for my favorite warm weather treat, ice cream. As a native Vermonter, I feel a special connection to Ben & Jerry's. The company was founded the year I was born, and everything about them, from their flavors to their social activism, lines up with what I love. When we were nine, my friend Stephanie and I invented some of our own flavors and sent a letter to Ben & Jerry's with our ideas. We got a handwritten note back from Jerry. Dear Gretchen and Stephanie, thanks so much for writing. I really like the name Rainbow Gumbo, but I think I like the ingredients of Champs Chomps better. Maybe we can mix them. Happy mud season, Jerry. You can support this podcast by visiting beforeitsgone.show and clicking on the donate button. Thank you. One of my favorite flavors as a kid was Rainforest Crunch. According to the epitaph in the Flavor Graveyard, they only made it in 1988, but it seemed to me that it was around for more than just one year. With aching heart and heavy sigh, we bid Rainforest Crunch goodbye. That nutty brittle from exotic places got sticky in between our braces. I wasn't a brace wearer, so I never had that issue. I just really liked how the ice cream tasted, and I liked the idea that eating it was helping to save the rainforest. Of course, with a quick Google search, I just discovered that Rainforest Crunch ice cream didn't actually help farmers or the rainforest nearly as much as the labeling on the pint would have you believe. I didn't ask Chris about any of that. But we did talk about how climate change is impacting ingredients in some of Ben & Jerry's most popular flavors. Climate change sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we're a food company, right? We're sourcing ingredients from all over the world. We're sourcing milk and dairy products from 30 miles north of here from the northwestern corner of Vermont. And we're sourcing things like vanilla, cocoa, and coffee uh, from uh, you know the global south and so many of the products that we put in a pint that create people's favorite flavors you know come from places that could be profoundly impacted by climate change in fact we're already beginning to see some impacts on uh, certain aspects of the supply chain so if you look at things like coffee or you look at things like vanilla or cocoa uh, these are commodities that are already being impacted by changing climate patterns I asked how Ben & Jerry's addresses these issues when they're sourcing their ingredients. What we try and do is, is not to source just commodities. We, we seek to build sort of long-term relationships with our supply chain partners. So for example, we've been working with a, a coffee cooperative in Mexico, uh, a region called Huatusco. It's about 1,500 uh, uh, farmers uh, that grow coffee and we've been uh, sourcing coffee from them for a number of years. So what we like about that approach is it allows us to build sort of better, more deeper relationships with the communities that are growing the things we're putting into our pints. It allows us to sort of invest more in these communities over time. Uh, and we think all of that helps create, uh, you know, better tasting ingredients. And, and so that's the approach we like to take. If you listen to our last episode about coffee, you can guess where this is going. There are two things that impact uh, Huatusco over the last couple of years. The first is uh, they've had some extreme weather. They had uh, a particularly strong storm that blew the roof off of uh, one of their production buildings. And it actually had a pretty profound impact on some of the farmers in the Huatusco co-op. Uh, their, their production uh, decreased 70% uh, 
uh, last year. So that does a couple of things. It reduces obviously the income that goes to those farmers, but uh, it also reduces the supply available for purchase by companies like ours. The other thing that's impacting uh, that, that sort of region of coffee growers is a fungus called rust. So that too has an impact on production levels. So I wondered, do they think about these issues when they're coming up with new flavors? I think the quick answer is probably not. I think our flavor gurus uh, are sort of sitting back here in the lab thinking about great new flavors. And I think, you know, I mean, I think, look, I think we are concerned about the changes that we're seeing globally and in regions where we're sourcing ingredients. You know, our hope is that through, you know, action at a macro level uh, as a planet, you know, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, the idea that we are really beginning to see uh, a, a break in the link between economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions, that's a really important sign. I think, you know, the, the, the rapid uptake we're seeing in renewables, the, you know, innovation in things like, you know, electric vehicles all give us hope that over time, uh, you know, we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. I think the other thing that we need to be doing and that, that we're beginning to do is investing in these communities, in these communities that are growing ingredients for us, to do two things. One, help them diversify. Uh, uh, their economy, so they're not just focused on growing a single commodity that can wipe a community out if there's a, a, an extreme weather event, right? And, and the second is to invest a bit in climate resilience. So it's our hope uh, that, that, you know, we, we will still have access to great cocoa, vanilla, and coffee, but, you know, there are risks. So given the climate risks, I asked if it might be better for people to avoid these endangered flavors. I mean, I love chocolate, but I'm happy to eat mint and black raspberry if that's going to be better for the planet. We don't want people to avoid purchasing these flavors, right? I think, I think you know, the point here is to, to put on the table for what's at risk, but we want people to continue to support, you know, the, the coffee growing regions, the cocoa growing regions, the vanilla growing regions of the world. Uh, and so I think by highlighting their vulnerability, uh, hopefully we can motivate people to, to support the kinds of policies and actions that will save these communities and their favorite flavors. And of course, given that we're talking about ice cream, you can't ignore the impact of the cows. Yeah, I mean, if you think about our, our, our sort of impact and what's in a pint, it's, we're a dairy company. <coughs> We, we buy a whole bunch of milk and cream, and that's our obviously our single biggest purchase from an ingredient perspective. It's also where our largest impact is. One alternative they're exploring is almond milk. You know, we have this new line of non-dairy flavors um, that have performed incredibly well. They are super delicious flavors that I think, you know, if you, if you didn't tell most people that they didn't they weren't dairy-based, people wouldn't know. They sort of live up to our chunky, swirly, uh, uh, you know, sort of reputation. And I think if you look at the, the carbon footprint of a pint of non-dairy ice cream, it's a third less than, than the dairy flavors. But ice cream purists needn't worry. The future won't be dairy-free. I mean, we're talking about how do we build a, a, a new model for Vermont's dairy industry. How do we go from something currently that, you know, we all know has not been particularly great for the environment. We've got real water quality issues in Lake Champlain. How do we go from something that has been hard on the environment to something that becomes more regenerative, that, that becomes not a source of greenhouse gas emissions from uh, uh, cows, methane, but, but is sequestering carbon in healthy soils. To build that better future, Ben & Jerry's is working closely with dairy farmers, the same way they are with coffee farmers. We've got a, a long-term relationship with the St. Albans Dairy Cooperative. It's a cooperative of family farmers, uh, primarily in northwestern Vermont. Uh, we currently have a, 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 a 
sustainability program for uh, our, our dairy farms. We're also engaged in sort of thinking um, sort of in a much bigger way about how we move from sort of small incremental uh, sort of progress on dairy farms to how do you how do you think about really what does the dairy farm of the future look like and how do we get there in a way that doesn't take us 40 years. So if cream creates the biggest impact for Ben and Jerry's, ice is probably second. We're producing a product uh, that requires staying frozen and we ship a lot of ice cream uh, to far-flung places. Uh, we, we sell ice cream in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand. All of that ice cream is made here in the state of Vermont with fabulous Vermont dairy, uh, but ship frozen around the world. So the point is we have a sizable uh, carbon footprint. So first thing we need to do is work as hard as we can uh, to ensure that we're minimizing the, the negative impacts that we have. To reduce those impacts, they're changing how they do business. We're doing that through a bunch of ways. We're investing in efficiency at our manufacturing plants. We've, uh, uh, re this year, the beginning of this year, brought a solar array online at our Waterbury plant that generates about 20% of the energy that we use at that plant. Uh, we've instituted an internal carbon tax across the company, so a, a per ton fee across the entire life cycle of our product and production from the farm to end of life on the packaging. And we're using that money to invest in reducing the footprint of our business. Um, so that's whether that's in our manufacturing plants or in fact investing in climate resilience uh, in the supply chain. Chris sees these types of changes as inevitable, nothing radical. I think that's sort of, that's the cost of doing business these days. It's, it's tough to be uh, in, in the business world without having some sort of sustainability strategy that's fo focused on climate and energy. But even if businesses are leading, the government needs to get involved. We need policies that incent this transition. We are going to transition to a cleaner, greener, decentralized uh, sort of economy and energy system. And I think the question is, are we going to get there in time and are we going to get there in a way that has the U.S. leading, that, that has the benefits that accrue from that transition coming to the United States? The innovation so often happens here, but the commercialization sometimes doesn't. And so uh, that for me is the question. Those changes are happening, but it's not because of government leadership. So much of what we have seen over the past decade comes from market-driven forces. The truth is we are transitioning away from coal not because of some supposed war on coal, but because the cost of natural gas and renewables is now cheaper than coal. And so those market forces aren't going to change. They are going to accelerate, but, but I think we need a national price on carbon. We need to support the build out of electric vehicle infrastructure. So I think those kinds of uh, policies at the national level are incredibly important. So part of Ben and Jerry's strategy is to join with other businesses and lobby the government. We're proud members of the Bicep Coalition, uh, a group of companies that are advocating for you know, aggressive climate and energy policies at the national level. We think that, that those kinds of policies not only are not bad for business, but they'll actually be good for the economy, that they will drive the kind of innovation and investment that will deliver the, the sort of clean energy economy of the future. And, and absent those policies, I think the bicep companies really feel like uh, uh, the, the economic sort of benefits that will accrue to the, to the global economy will happen outside the United States. So we're, we're incredibly optimistic that um, uh, sort of national policies that reduce emissions will drive you know, economic performance for our businesses and the economy. One surprising issue they're lobbying on, which actually makes sense when you consider it, is fuel standards. 
we ship a lot of stuff by trucks. It's an important and, and not insignificant piece of our environmental footprint. But Ben & Jerry's doesn't make trucks. We can't, we, we can't innovate a more fuel efficient truck. But, but uh, aggressive fuel economy standards that will push the, the truck manufacturers to create more efficient trucks will have a big impact on our footprint. And so those are the kinds of policies that we need to see that will reduce emissions and energy inputs across the economy that will allow our business and all other businesses uh, to become less carbon intensive. But it's not just about lobbying the government. Ben & Jerry's also takes their issues straight to the people. I think many companies uh, tend not to take positions on issues and, and engage their, their fans or consumers on those issues. We think that's a big opportunity for us that, that, you know, for better or for worse, corporations are probably the most powerful entity in society now. And the question is, as a, as a company, uh, are you going to use that for sort of good or evil? And I think the opportunity here is, is to, to, to help people uh, understand these issues that are based in our set of values and to help them take action on the issues. As Chris sees it, consumer activism can be a powerful lever for creating change. I think uh, people largely feel tuned out and turned off by the political process and feel like that doesn't work. Uh, and so I think, you know, people have strong affinities for companies and brands. There is an opportunity to create connections with fans and consumers around a shared set of values. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's something I think we're proud of here. And I think it's, it's a big opportunity for other companies and brands uh, to take on. Of course, taking a stand on issues can turn off some customers. Ben & Jerry's doesn't care. Our marketing people may not love me to say this, but I think you know, the truth is we don't need everyone to love us, right? We need some people to really, really dig what we do. And so, you know, by definition, anytime you take a position on an issue that's controversial, whether that's calling for a carbon tax, supporting marriage equality, or our recent statement in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, whenever you do that kind of thing, there are going to be some people that disagree with you. And, and, and that's all right, I, you know, I think, it, it, is, it is sort of better to be loved by some than inoffensive to everyone. And, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're really proud of, of, you know, our ability to kind of do this advocacy work and to engage our fans and consumers in it. Uh, and, and I think it's impactful. I think it's impactful from a business perspective, but I also think it's impactful from a, a progressive social change uh, uh, point of view. I think, you know, we have been a part of helping make change here in the state of Vermont, but I think also nationally too. And, and I think that's a really powerful idea. This approach to consumer engagement is really different from what other companies do. I think part of what makes what we do here sort of credible and authentic is we don't design it to make our fans or consumers happy, right? I think we sort of talk about the work that we do on, on advocacy, these sort of values-led activism campaigns as being really different from cause-related marketing. That a typical cause-related marketing campaign starts with sort of who are my consumers, what's that demographic, what do they care about, and how do I connect with them around something they care about? I think we, we start from a very different place. We start with who are we, what are our values, what's the change we want to make in the world, and then how do we develop a campaign or an engagement strategy to reach our fans and consumers in a way that is sort of uh, engaging, inspiring, and ultimately motivates them to take action. So the end result may look real similar, but sort of the place at which it starts is really different, and I think that's what sort of makes what we do, credible, authentic, and, you know, even if you disagree with us, you know, it's hard to say that we're just doing this to sell more ice cream. It really is based deeply in our values. 
So Ben & Jerry's has been at it for 40 years, mixing ice cream with activism. I asked Chris what he thinks things will look like 40 years from now. I'm by nature optimistic. I think, you know, I think some of the profound challenges that our country and our planet faces can be overcome. There will be new innovations uh, that make our company and our products um, less harmful and I hope over time not just less bad but actually good. For him, it all comes down to the power of business to create change. I just think there's such a big opportunity for other companies to help build the political will in the U.S. for action on this stuff. I would challenge and, and encourage other businesses and business leaders to kind of lean in on these issues. Uh, and, and I think if we do that, the future's bright. Before It's Gone is listener supported. And supporters get access to cool things, like the full interviews on video with our guests. A lot of things get left out during editing, and they're really interesting. You can hear them if you become a supporter of the show. Just visit beforeitsgone.show and click on the donate button. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Next time on Before It's Gone, we're going old school and talking about all those skills my grandmother wanted to teach me and I never wanted to learn. Things like gardening, canning, mending, repairing. But now it's seeming more and more like the future might require those talents. And the people who can teach them are fewer and fewer. I can't go to my grandmother now. So I go talk to Melody Fig for a conversation about how she's bringing homesteading skills back to the people. That's it for this episode of Before It's Gone. Thanks again for listening. You can find out more about the show and how to support us at beforeitsgone.show. And if you like the podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Thanks again.